The story of Sinbad the sailor. In the reign of the same caliph, Harun al-Rashid, of whom we have already heard, there lived at Baghdad a poor porter, called Hindbad. One day, when the weather was excessively hot, he was employed to carry a heavy burden from one end of the town to the other. Being much fatigued, he took off his load, and sat upon it, near a large mansion. He was much pleased that he stopped at this place, for the agreeable smell of wood of aloes and of pastels, that came from the house, mixing with the scent of the rose water, completely perfumed and embalmed the air. Besides, he heard from within a concert of instrumental music, accompanied with the harmonious notes of nightingales and other birds. This charming melody, and the smell of several sorts of savory dishes, made the porter conclude there was a feast, with great rejoicings within. His business seldom leading him that way, he knew not to whom the mansion belonged, but he went to some of the servants, whom he saw standing at the gate in magnificent apparel, and asked the name of the proprietor. How, replied one of them, do you live in Baghdad, and know not that this is the house of Sinbad the sailor, that famous voyager, who has sailed round the world. Footnote 50. These voyages of Sinbad are among the most curious of the tales contained in the Arabian Nights. They deserve a passing word of remark. Mr. Richard Hull of Exeter, about a century since, wrote a treatise upon them. He shows that while they must be regarded in many respects as fabulous, yet that they illustrate the early stories prevalent about strange countries. The earlier writers, as Plutarch, Elian, Diodorus Siculus, and Pliny, mention the incidents related in these tales, as also do the earliest modern travelers, the Venetian Marco Polo, and the English Sir John Mandeville. The porter lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, loud enough to Beherd, Almighty Creator of all things, consider the difference between Sinbad and me. I am every day exposed to fatigues and calamities, and can scarcely get coarse barley bread for myself and my family, while happy Sinbad profusely expends immense riches, and leads a life of continual pleasure. What has he done to obtain from thee a lot so agreeable? And what have I done to deserve one so wretched? While the porter was thus indulging his melancholy, a servant came out of the house, and taking him by the arm, bade him follow him, for Sinbad, his master, wanted to speak to him. The servant brought him into a great hall, where a number of peoples at round a table covered with all sorts of savory dishes. At the upper end sat a comely, venerable gentleman, with a long white beard, and behind him stood a number of officers and domestics, all ready to attend his pleasure. This person was Sinbad, Hindbad, whose fear was increased at the sight of so many people, and of a banquet so sumptuous, saluted the company, trembling. Sinbad bade him draw near, and seating him at his right hand, served him himself, and gave him excellent wine, of which there was abundance upon the sideboard. Now Sinbad had himself heard the porter complain through the window, and this it was that induced him to have him brought in. When Therapast was over, Sinbad addressed his conversation to Hindbad, and inquired his name and employment, and said, I wish to hear from your own mouth what it was you lately said in the street. At this request, Hindbad hung down his head in confusion, and replied, My lord, I confess that my fatigue put me out of humor and occasioned me to utter some indiscreet words, which I beg you to pardon. Do not think I am so unjust, resumed Sinbad, as to resent such a complaint. But I must rectify your error concerning myself. You think, no doubt, that I have acquired without labor and trouble the ease and indulgence which I now enjoy. But do not mistake, I did not attain to this happy condition without enduring for several years more trouble of body and mind than can well be imagined. Yes, gentlemen, he added, speaking to the whole company, I assure you that my sufferings have been of a nature so extraordinary as would deprive the greatest miser of his love of riches, and as an opportunity now offers, I will, with your leave, relate the dangers I have encountered, which I think will not be uninteresting to you. The first voyage of Sinbad the sailor my father was a wealthy merchant of much repute. He bequeathed me a large estate, which I wasted in riotous living. I quickly perceived my error, and that I was misspending my time, which is of all things the most valuable. I remember the saying of the great Solomon, which I had frequently heard from my father, a good name is better than precious ointment, and again, wisdom is good with an inheritance. Struck with these reflections, I resolved to walk in my father's ways, and I entered into a contract with some merchants, and embarked with them on board a ship we had jointly fitted out. We set sail, and steered our course toward the Indies, through the Persian Gulf, which is formed by the coasts of Arabia Felix on the right, and by those of Persia on the left. At first I was troubled with seasickness, but speedily recovered my health, and was not afterward subject to that complaint.
In our voyage we touched at several islands, where we sold or exchanged our goods. One day, while under sail, we were becalmed near a small island, but little elevated above the level of the water, Andre assembling a green meadow. The captain ordered his sails to be furled, and permitted such persons as were so inclined to land, of this number I was one. But while we were enjoying ourselves and eating and drinking, Andre covering ourselves from the fatigue of the sea, the island on a sudden trembled, and shook us terribly. The trembling of the island was perceived on board the ship, and we were called upon to re-embark speedily, or we should all be lost, for what we took for an island proved to be the back 51 of a sea monster. The nimblest got into the sloop, others betook themselves to swimming, but as for myself, I was still upon the island when it disappeared into the sea, and I had only time to catch hold of a piece of wood that we had brought out of the ship to make a fire. Meanwhile the captain, having received those on board who were in the sloop, and taken up some of those that swam, resolved to improve the favorable gale that had just risen, and hoisting his sails pursued his voyage, so that it was impossible for me to recover the ship. Footnote 51. Milton thus describes the Leviathan. How happily slumbering on the Norway foam, the pilot of some small night foundered skiff, deeming some island, oft as seamen tell, with fixed anchor in his scally rind moors by his side. Thus was I exposed to the mercy of the waves all the rest of the day and the following night. By this time I found my strength gone, and despaired of saving my life, when happily a wave threw me against an island. The bank was high and rugged, so that I could scarcely have got up had it not been for some roots of trees which I found within reach. When the sun arose, though I was very feeble, both from hard labor and want of food, I crept along to find some herbs fatigue, and had the good luck not only to procure some, but likewise to discover a spring of excellent water, which contributed much to cover me. After this I advanced farther into the island, and at last reached a fine plain, where I perceived some horses feeding. I went toward them, when I heard the voice of a man, who immediately appeared, and asked me who I was. I related to him my adventure, after which, taking me by the hand, he led me into a cave, where there were several other people, no less amazed to see me than I was to see them. I partook of some provisions which they offered me. I then asked them what they did in such a desert place, to which they answered that they were grooms belonging to the Maharaja, sovereign of the island, and that every year they brought thither the king's horses for pasturage. They added that they were to return home on the morrow, and had I been on day later I must have perished, because the inhabited part of the island was a great distance off, and it would have been impossible for them to have got thither without a guide. Next morning they returned to the capital of the island, took me with them, and presented me to the Maharaja. He asked me who I was, and by what adventure I had come into his dominions. After I had satisfied him, he told me he was much concerned for my misfortune, and at the same time ordered that I should want for nothing, which commands his officers were so generous and careful as to see exactly fulfilled. Being a merchant, I frequented men of my own profession, and particularly inquired for those who were strangers, that perchance I might hear news from Baghdad, or find an opportunity to return. For the Maharaja's capital is situated on the seacoast, and has a fine harbor, where ships arrive daily from the different quarters of the world. I frequented also the society of the learned Indians, and took delight to hear them converse, but withal, I took care to make my court regularly to the Maharaja, and conversed with the governors and petty kings, his tributaries, that were about him. They put a thousand questions respecting my country, and I, being willing to inform myself as to their laws and customs, asked them concerning everything which I thought worth knowing. There belongs to this king an island named Castle. They assured me that every night a noise of drums was heard there, whence the mariners fancied that it was the residence of Jijil. I determined to visit this wonderful place, and in my way thither saw fishes of 100 and 200 cubits long, that occasion more fear than hurt, for they are so timorous that they will fly upon the rattling of two sticks or boards. I saw likewise other fish, about a cubit in length, that had heads like owls. As I was one day at the port after my return, the ship arrived in which I had embarked at Busora. I at once knew the captain, and I went and asked him for my bales. I am Sinbad, said I, and those bales marked with his name are mine. When the captain heard me speak thus, heavens! He exclaimed, whom can we trust in these times? I saw Sinbad perish with my own eyes, ASDID also the passengers on board, and yet you tell me you are that Sinbad. What impudence is this, and what a false tale to tell, in order to possess yourself of what does not belong to you. Have patience, replied I. Do me the favor to hear what I have to say. The captain was at length persuaded that I was no cheat, 
for there came people from his ship who knew me, paid me great compliments, and expressed much joy at seeing me alive. At last he recollected me himself, and embracing me, heaven be praised, said he, for your happy escape. I cannot express the joy it affords me. There are your goods, take and do with them as you please. I took out what was most valuable in my bales, and presented them to the Maharaja, who, knowing my misfortune, asked me how I came by Socrates. I acquainted him with the circumstance of their recovery. He was pleased at my good luck, accepted my present, and in return gave me one much more considerable. Upon this I took leave of him, and went aboard the same ship after I had exchanged my goods for the commodities of that country. I carried with me wood of aloes, sandals, camphor, nutmegs, cloves, pepper, and ginger. We passed by several islands, and at last arrived at Busora, from whence I came to this city, with the value of 100,000 sequins. Sinbad stopped here, and ordered the musicians to proceed with their concert, which the story had interrupted. When it was evening, Sinbad sent for a purse of 100 sequins, and giving it to the porter, said, Take this, Hindbad, return to your home, and come back tomorrow to hear more of my adventures. The porter went away, astonished at the honor done him, and the present made him. The account of this adventure proved very agreeable to his wife and children, who did not fail to return thanks for what providence had sent them by the hand of Sinbad. Hindbad put on his best robe next day, and returned to the bountiful traveler, who received him with a pleasant air, and welcomed him heartily. When all the guests had arrived, dinner was served, and continued a long time. When it was ended, Sinbad, addressing himself to the company, said, Gentlemen, be pleased to listen to the adventures of my second voyage. They deserve your attention even more than those of the first. Upon which every one held his peace, and Sinbad proceeded. The second voyage of Sinbad the Sailori designed, after my first voyage, to spend the rest of my days at Baghdad, but it was not long ere I grew weary of an indolent life, and he put to sea a second time, with merchants of known probity. We embarked on board a good ship, and, after recommending ourselves to God, set sail. We traded from island to island, and exchanged commodities with great profit. One day we landed on an island covered with several sorts of fruit trees, but we could see neither man nor animal. We walked in the meadows, along the streams that watered them. While some diverted themselves with gathering flowers, and others fruits, I took my wine and provisions, and sat down near a stream betwixt two high trees, which formed a thick shade. I made a good meal, and afterward fell asleep. I cannot tell how long I slept, but when I awoke the ship was gone. In this sad condition I was ready to die with grief. I cried out in agony, beat my head and breast, and threw myself upon the ground, where I lay some time in despair. I upbraided myself a hundred times for not being content with the produce of my first voyage, that might have sufficed me all my life. But all this was in vain, and my repentance came too late. At last I resigned myself to the will of God. Not knowing what to do, I climbed to the top of a lofty tree, from whence I looked about on all sides, to see if I could discover anything that could give me hope. When I gazed toward the sea I could see nothing but sky and water, but looking over the land, I beheld something white, and coming down, I took what provision I had left and went toward it, the distance being so great that I could not distinguish what it was. As I approached, I thought it to be a white dome, of a prodigious height and extent, and when I came up to it, I touched it, and found it to be very smooth. I went round to see if it was open on any side, but saw it was not, and that there was no climbing up to the top, as it was so smooth. It was at least fifty paces round. By this time the sun was about to set, and all of a sudden the sky became as dark as if it had been covered with a thick cloud. I was much astonished at this sudden darkness, but much more when I found it was occasioned by a bird of a monstrous size, that came flying toward me. I remembered that I had often heard mariners speak of a miraculous bird called the rock, 52, and conceived that the great dome which I so much admired must be its egg. In short, the bird alighted, and sought over the egg. As I perceived her coming, I crept close to the egg, so that I had before me one of the legs of the bird, which was as big as trunk of a tree. I tied myself strongly to it with my turban, in hopes that the rock next morning would carry me with her out of this desert island. After having passed the night in this condition, the bird flew away as soon as it was daylight, and carried me so high that I could not discern the earth, she afterward descended with so much rapidity that I lost my senses. But when I found myself on the ground, I speedily untied the knot, and had scarcely done so, when the rock, having taken up a serpent of a monstrous length in her bill, flew away. 
The spot where it left me was encompassed on all sides by mountains, that seemed to reach above the clouds, and so steep that there was no possibility of getting out of the valley. This was a new perplexity, so that when I compared this place with the desert island from which the rock had brought me, I found that I had gained nothing by the change. Footnote 52. Mr. Moore, in his account of these voyages, says that Marco Polo, in his underscore travels underscore, and Father Martini, in his underscore history of China underscore, speak of this bird, called underscore rutch underscore, and say it will take up an elephant and a rhinoceros. It is as fabulous as the dodo, the salamander, or the phoenix. As I walked through this valley, I perceived it was strewn with diamonds, some of which were of surprising bigness. I took pleasure in looking upon them, but shortly I saw at a distance such objects as greatly diminished my satisfaction, and which I could not view without terror, namely, a great number of serpents, so monstrous that the least of them was capable of swallowing an elephant. They retired in the daytime to their dens, where they hid themselves from the rock, their enemy, and came out only in the night. I spent the day in walking about in the valley, resting myself at times in such places as I thought most convenient. When night came Oni went into a cave, where I thought I might repose in safety. I secured the entrance, which was low and narrow, with a great stone, top reserve me from the serpents, but not so far as to exclude the light. I supped on part of my provisions, but the serpents, which began hissing round me, put me into such extreme fear that I did not sleep. One day appeared the serpents retired, and I came out of the cave, trembling. I can justly say that I walked upon diamonds without feeling any inclination to touch them. At last I sat down, and notwithstanding my apprehensions, not having closed my eyes during the night, fell asleep, after having eaten a little more of my provisions, but I had scarcely shut my eyes when something that fell by me with a great noise awakened me. This was a large piece of raw meat, and at the same time I saw several others fall down from the rocks in different places. I had always regarded as fabulous what I had heard sailors and others relate of the Valley of Diamonds, and of the stratagems employed by merchants to obtain jewels from thence, but now I found that they had stated nothing but the truth. For the fact is, that the merchants comato the neighborhood of this valley, when the eagles have young ones, and throwing great joints of meat into the valley, the diamonds, upon whose points they fall, stick to them, the eagles, which are stronger in this country than anywhere else, pounce with great force upon those pieces of meat, and carry them to their nests on the precipices of the rocks to feed their young. The merchants at this time run to their nests, disturb and drive off the eagles by their shouts, and take away the diamonds that stick to the meat. I perceived in this device the means of my deliverance. Having collected together the largest diamonds I could find, and put them into the leather bag in which I used to carry my provisions, I took the largest of the pieces of meat, tied it close round me with the cloth of my turban, and then laid myself upon the ground, with my face downward, the bag of diamonds being made fast to my girdle. I had scarcely placed myself in this posture when one of the eagles, having taken me up with the piece of meat to which I was fastened, carried me to his nest on the top of the mountain. The merchants immediately began their shouting to frighten the eagles, and when they had obliged them to quit their prey, one of them came to the nest where I was. He was much alarmed when he saw me, but recovering himself, instead of inquiring how I came thither, began to quarrel with me, and asked why I stole his goods. You will treat me, replied I, with more civility when you know me better. Do not be uneasy, I have diamonds enough for you and myself, more than all the other merchants together. Whatever they have the out a chance, but I selected for myself, in the bottom of the valley, those which you see in this bag. I had scarcely done speaking, when the other merchants came crowding about us, much astonished to see me, but they were much more surprised when I told them my story. They conducted me to their encampment, and there, having opened my bag, they were surprised at the largeness of my diamonds, and confessed that they had never seen any of such size and perfection. I prayed the merchant who owned the nest to which I had been carried, for every merchant had his own, to take as many for his share as he pleased. He contented himself with one, and that, too, the least of them, and when I pressed him to take more, without fear of doing me any injury, no, said he, I am very well satisfied with this, which is valuable enough to save me the trouble of making any more voyages, and will raise as great a fortune as I desire. I spent the night with the merchants, to whom I related my story a second time, for the satisfaction of those who had not heard it. I could not moderate my joy when I found myself delivered from the danger I have mentioned. I thought myself in a dream, and could scarcely believe myself out of danger. The merchants had thrown their pieces of meat into the valley for several days, 
and each of them being satisfied with the diamonds that had fall into his lot, we left the place the next morning, and traveled near high mountains, where there were serpents of a prodigious length, which we had the good fortune to escape. We took shipping at the first port we reached, and touched at the Isle of Roja, where the trees grow that yield camphor. This tree is so large, and its branches so thick, that one hundred men may easily sit under its shade. The juice, of which the camphor is made, exudes from a hole board in the upper part of the tree, and is received in a vessel, where it thickens to a consistency, and becomes what we call camphor. After the juice is thus drawn out, the tree withers and dies. In this island is also found the rhinoceros, an animal less than the elephant but larger than the buffalo. It has a horn upon its nose, about a cubit in length, this horn is solid, and cleft through the middle. The rhinoceros fights with the elephant, runs his horn into his belly, 53 and carries him off upon his head, but the blood and the fat of the elephant running into his eyes and making him blind, he falls to the ground, and then, strange to relate, the rock comes and carries them both away in her claws, for food for her young ones. I pass over many other things peculiar to this island, lest I should weary you. Here I exchanged some of my diamonds for merchandise. From hence we went to other islands, and at last, having touched at several trading towns of the continent, we landed at Busora, from whence I proceeded to Baghdad. There I immediately gave large presents to the poor, and lived honorably upon the vast riches I had brought, and gained with so much fatigue. Footnote 53. Captain Marriott, in his underscore Bushboys underscore, gives an account of this contest, in which the rhinoceros came off victorious. He also gives, in the same amusing volume, an account of a bird taking up a serpent into the air. The scene of the adventures of the underscore Bushboys underscore is South Africa. Thus Sinbad ended the relation of the second voyage, gave Hindbad another hundred sequins, and invited him to come the next day to hearth account of the third. The third voyage of Sinbad the SAILORI soon again grew weary of living a life of idleness, and hardening myself against the thought of any danger, I embarked with so memor chance on another long voyage. We touched at several ports, we traded. One day we were overtaken by a dreadful tempest, which drove us from our course. The storm continued several days, and brought us before the port of an island, which the captain was very unwilling to enter, but we were obliged to cast anchor. When we had furled our sails the captain told us that this and some other neighboring islands were inhabited by hairy savages, who would speedily attack us, and though they were but dwarfs we must make no resistance, for they were more in number than the locusts, and if we happened to kill one, they would all fall upon us and destroy us. We soon found that what the captain had told us was but too true. An innumerable multitude of frightful savages, about two feet high, covered all over with red hair, came swimming toward us, and encompassed our ship. They chattered as they came near, but we understood not their language. They climbed up the sides of the ship with such agility as surprised us. They took down our sails, cut the cable, and hauling to the shore, made us all get out, and afterward carried the ship into another island, from whence they had come. As we advanced, we perceived at a distance a vast pile of building, and made toward it. We found it to be a palace, elegantly built, and very lofty, with a gate of ebony of two leaves, which we opened. We saw before us a large apartment, with a porch, having on one side a heap of human bones, and on the other a vast number of roasting spits. We trembled at this spectacle, and were seized with deadly apprehension, when suddenly the gate of the apartment opened with a loud crash, and there came out the horrible figure of a black man, a stall as a lofty palm tree. He had but one eye, and that in the middle of his forehead, where it blazed bright as a burning coal. His foreteeth were very long and sharp, and stood out of his mouth, which was as deep as that of a horse. His upper lip hung down upon his breast. His ears resembled those of an elephant, and covered his shoulders, and his nails were as long and crooked as the talons of the greatest birds. At the sight of so frightful a genie we became insensible, and lay like dead men. At last we came to ourselves, and saw him sitting in the porch looking at us. When he had considered us well, he advanced toward us, and laying his hand upon me, took me up by the nape of my neck, and turned me around, as a butcher would do a sheep's head. After having examined me, and perceiving me to be so lean that I was nothing but skin and bone, he let me go. He took up all the rest one by one, and viewed them in the same manner. The captain being the fattest, he held him with one hand, as I would do a sparrow, and thrust a spit through him, he then kindled a great fire, roasted, and ate him in his apartment for his supper. Having finished his repast, he returned to his porch, where he lay and fell asleep, snoring louder than thunder. 
he slept this till morning. As for ourselves, it was not possible for us to enjoy any rest, so that we passed the night in the most painful apprehension that can be imagined. When day appeared the giant awoke, got up, went out, and left us in the palace. The next night we determined to revenge ourselves on the brutish giant, and did so in the following manner. After he had again finished his inhuman supper on another of our seamen, he lay down on his back, and fell asleep. As soon as we heard him snore according to his custom, nine of the boldest among us, and myself, took each of us aspid, and putting the points of them into the fire till they were burning hot, we thrust them into his eye all at once, and blinded fifty-four him. The pain made him break out into a frightful yell. He started up, and stretched out his hands in order to sacrifice some of us to his rage, but we ran to such places as he could not reach, and after having sought for us in vain, he groped for the gate, and went out, howling in agony. Footnote 54. The youthful student will find in these reference passages which will remind in some degree of the incidents mentioned in these tales. Homer's underscore Odyssey underscore, book IV, lines 350 to 410, underscore Iliad underscore, book XX, line 220, book She, lines 20 to 35, Virgil, underscore Aeneid underscore, E, lines 356 to 542. We immediately left the palace, and came to the shore, where with sama timber that lay about in great quantities, we made some rafts, each large enough to carry three men. We waited until day to get upon them, for we hoped if the giant did not appear by sunrise, and give over his howling, which we still heard, that he would prove to be dead, and if that happened to be the case, we resolved to stay on that island, and not to risk our lives upon the rafts. But day had scarcely appeared when we perceived our cruel enemy, with two others, almost of the same size, leading him, and a great number more coming before him at a quick pace. We did not hesitate to take to our rafts, but put to sea with all the speed we could. The giants, who perceived this, took up great stones, and running to the shore they entered the water up to the middle, and threw so exactly that they sank all the rafts but that I was upon, and all my companions, except the two with me, were drowned. We rowed with all our might, and got out of the reach of the giants. But when we go out to sea we were exposed to the mercy of the waves and winds, and spent that day and the following night under the most painful uncertainty as to our fate, but next morning we had the good fortunato be thrown upon an island, where we landed with much joy. We found excellent fruit, which afforded us great relief, and recruited our strength. At night we went to sleep on the seashore, but were awakened by the noise of a serpent of surprising length and thickness, whose scales made a rustling noise as he wound himself along. It swallowed up one of my comrades, notwithstanding his loud cries and the efforts he made to extricate himself from it. Dashing him several times against the ground, it crushed him, and we could hear it gnaw and tear the poor fellow's bones, though we had fled to a considerable distance. The following day, to our great terror, we saw the serpent again, when I exclaimed, Oh heaven, to what dangers are we exposed? We rejoiced yesterday at having escaped from the cruelty of a giant and the rage of the waves, now are we fallen into another danger equally dreadful. As we walked about, we saw a large tall tree, upon which we designed to pass the following night for our security, and having satisfied our hunger with fruit, we mounted it accordingly. Shortly after, the serpent came hissing to the foot of the tree, raised itself up against the trunk of it, and meeting with my comrade, who sat lower than I, swallowed him at once, and went off. I remained upon the tree till it was day, and then came down, more like a dead man than one alive, expecting the same fate as had befallen my two companions. This filled me with horror, and I advanced some steps to throw myself into the sea, but I withstood this dictate of despair, and submitted myself to the will of God, who disposes o four lives at his pleasure. In the meantime I collected together a great quantity of small wood, brambles, and dry thorns, and making them up into fagos, made a witty circle with them round the tree, and also tied some of them to the branches over my head. Having done this, when the evening came I shut myself up within this circle, with the melancholy satisfaction that I had neglected nothing which could preserve me from the cruel destiny with which I was threatened. The serpent failed not to come at the usual hour, and went round the tree, seeking for an opportunity to over me, but was prevented by the rampart I had made, so that he laid all day, like a cat watching in vain for a mouse that has fortunately reached a place of safety. When day appeared, he retired, but I dared not leave my fort until the sun arose. God took compassion on my hopeless state, for just as I was going, in a fit of desperation, to throw myself into the sea, I perceived a ship in the distance. 
I called as loud as I could, and unfolding the linen of my turban, displayed it, that they might observe me. This had the desired effect. The crew perceived me, and the captain sent his boat for me. As soon as I came on board, the merchants and seamen flocked about me, to know how I came into that desert island, and after I had related to them all that had befallen me, the oldest among them said they had several times heard of the giants that dwelt on that island, and that they were cannibals, and as to the serpents, they added that there were abundant in the island, that they hid themselves by day, and came abroad by night. After having testified their joy at my escaping so many dangers, they brought me the best of their provisions, and took me before the captain, who, seeing that I was in rags, gave me one of his own suits. Looking steadfastly upon him, I knew him to be the person who, on my second voyage, had left me in the island where I fell asleep, and had sailed without me, or without sending to seek for me. I was not surprised that he, believing me to be dead, did not recognize me. Captain, said I, look at me, and you may know that I am Sinbad, whom you left in that desert island. The captain, having considered me attentively, recognized me. God be praised, said he, embracing me, I rejoice that fortune has rectified my fault. There are your goods, which I always took care top reserve. I took them from him, and made him my acknowledgments for his care of them. We continued at sea for some time, touched at several islands, and at last landed at that of Salabot, 55 where sandalwood is obtained, which is much used in medicine. Footnote 55. Sandalwood. The wood of a low tree, the Santalum album, resembling the privet, and growing on the coast of Malabar, in the Indian archipelago, etc. The hard yellow wood in the center of the old sandal tree is highly esteemed for its fragrant perfume and is much used for kabi network, etc. From the Isle of Salabat we went to another, where I furnished myself with cloves, cinnamon, and other spices. As we sailed from this island we saw a tortoise twenty cubits in length and breadth. We observed also an amphibious animal like a cow, which gave milk, 56 its skin is so hard, that they usually make bucklers of it. I saw another, which odd the shape and color of a camel. 57 footnote 56. The hippopotamus. Footnote 57. The giraffe. In short, after a long voyage I arrived at Busora, and from thence returned to Baghdad with so much wealth that I knew not its extent. I gave a great deal to the poor, and bought another considerable estate. Thus Sinbad finished the history of his third voyage. He gave another hundred sequins to Hindbad, and invited him to dinner again the next day, to hear the fourth voyage of Sinbad the sailor after I had rested from the dangers of my third voyage, my passion for trade and my love of novelty soon again prevailed. I therefore settled my affairs, and provided a stock of goods fit for the traffic I designed to engage in. I took the route to Persia, traveled over several provinces, and then arrived at a port, where I embarked. On putting out to sea, we were overtaken by such a sudden gust of wind as obliged the captain to lower his yards, and take all other necessary precautions to prevent the danger that threatened us. But all was in vain, our endeavors had no effect. The sails were split in a thousand pieces, and the ship was stranded, several of the merchants and seamen were drowned, and the cargo was lost. I had the good fortune, with several of the merchants and mariners, tow it upon some planks, and we were carried by the current to an island which lay before us. There we found fruit and spring water, which preserved our lives. We stayed all night near the place where we had been cast ashore. Next morning, as soon as the sun was up, we explored the island, and saw some houses, which we approached. As soon as we drew near we were encompassed by a great number of Negroes, who seized us, shared us among them, and carried us to their respective habitations. I and five of my comrades were carried to one place, here they made USSIT down, and gave us a certain herb, which they made signs to us to eat. My comrades, not taking notice that the blacks ate none of it themselves, thought only of satisfying their hunger, and ate with greed in us. But I, suspecting some trick, would not so much as tastite, which happened well for me, for in a little time after I perceived my companions had lost their senses, and that when they spoke to Methi knew not what they said. The Negroes fed us afterward with rice, prepared with oil of coconuts, and my comrades, who had lost their reason, ate of it greedily. I also partook of it, but very sparingly. They gave us that herb at first on purpose to deprive us of our senses, that we might not be aware of the sad destiny prepared for us, and they supplied us with rice to fatten us, for, being cannibals, their design was to eat us as soon as we grew fat. This accordingly happened, for they devoured my comrades, who were not sensible of their condition, 
but my senses being entire, you may easily guess that instead of growing fat, as the rest did, I grew leaner every day. The fear of death turned all my food into poison. I fell into a languishing distemper, which proved my safety, for the Negroes, having killed and eaten my companions, seeing me Toby withered, lean, and sick, deferred my death. Meanwhile I had much liberty, so that scarcely any notice was taken of what I did, and this gave me an opportunity one day to get at a distance from the houses, and to make my escape. An old man who saw me, and suspected my design, called to me as loud as he could to return, but instead of obeying him, I redoubled my speed, and quickly got out of sight. At that time there was none but the old man about the houses, the rest being abroad, and not to return till night, which was usual with them. Therefore, being sure that they could not arrive in time to pursue me, I went on till night, when I stopped to rest a little, and to eat some of the provisions I had secured, but I speedily set forward again, and traveled seven days, avoiding those places which seemed to be inhabited, and lived for the most part upon coconuts which served me both for meat and drink. On the eighth day I came near the sea, and saw some white people, like myself, gathering pepper, of which there was great plenty in that place. This I took Toby a good omen, and went to them without any scruple. The people who gathered pepper came to meet me as soon as they saw me, and asked me in Arabic who I was and whence I came. I was overjoyed to hear them speak in my own language, and I satisfied their curiosity by giving them an account of my shipwreck, and how I fell into the hands of the Negroes. Those Negroes, replied they, eat men, and by what miracle did you escape their cruelty? I related to them the circumstances I have just mentioned, at which they were wonderfully surprised. I stayed with them till they had gathered their quantity of pepper, and then sailed with them to the island from whence they had come. They presented me to their king, who was a good prince. He had the patience to hear the relation of my adventures, which surprised him, and he afterward gave me clothes, and commanded care to be taken off me. The island was very well peopled, plentiful in everything, and the capital a place of great trade. This agreeable retreat was very comfortable to me after my misfortunes, and the kindness of this generous prince completed my satisfaction. In a word, there was not Apperson more in favor with him than myself, and consequently every man in court and city sought to oblige me, so that in a very little time I was looked upon rather as a native than a stranger. I observed one thing, which to me appeared very extraordinary. All the people, the king himself not excepted, rode their horses without bridle or stirrups. I went one day to a workman, and gave him a model for making the stock of a saddle. When that was done, I covered it myself with velvet and leather, and embroidered it with gold. I afterward went to a smith, who made me a bit, according to the pattern I showed him, and also some stirrups. When I had all things completed, I presented them to the king, and put them upon one of his horses. His majesty mounted immediately, and was so pleased with them that he testified his satisfaction by large presents. I made several others for the ministers and principal officers of his household, which gained me great reputation and regard. As I paid my court very constantly to the king, he said to me one day, Sinbad, I love thee. I have one thing to demand of thee, which thou must grant. I have a mind thou shouldst marry, that so thou mayest stay in my dominions, and think no more of thy own country. I durst not resist the prince's will, and he gave me one of the ladies of his court, noble, beautiful, and rich. The ceremonies of marriage being over, I went and dwelt with my wife, and for some time we lived together in perfect harmony. I was not, however, satisfied with my banishment. Therefore I designed to make my escape at the first opportunity, and to return to Baghdad, which my present settlement, how advantageous soever, could not make me forget. At this time the wife of one of my neighbors, with whom I had contracted a very strict friendship, fell sick and died. I went to see and comfort him in his affliction, and finding him absorbed in sorrow, I said to him, as soon as I saw him, God preserve you, and grant you a long life. Alas, replied he, how do you think I should obtain the favor you wish me? I have not above an hour to live, for I must be buried this day with my wife. This is a law on this island. The living husband I centered with the dead wife, and the living wife with the dead husband. While he was giving me an account of this barbarous custom, the very relation of which chilled my blood, his kindred, friends, and neighbors came to assist at the funeral. They dressed the corpse of the woman in her richest apparel and all her jewels, as if it had been her wedding day, then they placed her on an open bier, and began their march to the place of burial. The husband walked first, next to the dead body. 
They proceeded to a high mountain, and when they h a d reached the place of their destination they took up a large stone wick formed the mouth of a deep pit, and let down the body with all its apparel and jewels. Then the husband, embracing his kindred and friends, without resistance suffered himself to be placed on another bier, with a pot of water and seven small loaves, and was let down in the same manner. The ceremony being over, the mouth of the pit was again covered with the stone, and the company returned. I mention this ceremony the more particularly because I was in a few weeks' time to be the principal actor on a similar occasion. Alas, my own wife fell sick and died. I made every remonstrance I could to the king not to expose me, a foreigner, to this inhuman law. I appealed in vain. The king and all his court, with the most considerable persons of the city, sought to soften my sorrow by honoring the funeral ceremony with their presence, and at the termination of the ceremony I was lowered into the pit with a vessel full of water and seven loaves. As I approached the bottom I discovered, by the aid of the little light that came from above, the nature of this subterranean place, it seemed an endless cavern and might be about fifty fathoms deep. I lived for some time upon my bread and water, when, one day, just as he was on the point of exhaustion, I heard something tread, and breathing or panting as it moved. I followed the sound. The animal seemed to stop sometimes, but always fled and breathed hard as I approached. I pursued it for a considerable time, till at last I perceived a light, resembling a star. I went on, sometimes lost sight of it, but always found it again, and at last discovered that it came through a hole fifty-eight in the rock, which I got through, and found myself upon the seashore, at which I felt exceeding joy. I prostrated myself on the shore to thank God for this mercy, and shortly afterward I perceived a ship making for the place where I was. I made a sign with the linen of my turban, and called to the crew as loud as I could. They heard me, and sent a boat to bring me on board. It was fortunate for me that these people did not inspect the place where they found me, but without hesitation took me on board. Footnote 58. Aristomenes, the Messenian general, thus escaped from ACAVE. He perceived a fox near him gnawing a dead body, with one hand caught it by the hind leg, and with the other held its jaws, when IT attempted to bite him. Following, as well as he could, his struggling guide to the narrow crevice at which he entered, he the relit him go, and soon forced a passage through it to the welcome face of day. Hole, 141. Sancho's escape from the pit into which had humbled with Doffel is somewhat similar. We passed by several islands, and among others that called the Isle of Bells, about ten days sail from Serendib with a regular wind, and six from that of Kila, where we landed. Lead mines are found in the island, also Indian canes, and excellent camphor. The king of the Isle of Kila is very rich and powerful, and the Isle of Bells, which is about two days' journey away, is also subject to him. The inhabitants are so barbarous that they still eat human flesh. After we had finished our traffic in that island we put to sea again, and touched at several other ports, at last I arrived happily at Baghdad. Out of gratitude to God for his mercies, I contributed liberally toward the support of several mosques and the subsistence of the poor, and enjoyed myself with my friends in festivities and amusements. Here Sinbad made a new present of 100 sequins to Hindbad, whom he requested to return with the rest next day at the same hour, to dine with him and hear the story of his fifth voyage. The fifth voyage of Sinbad the sailor all the troubles and calamities I had undergone could not cure me of my inclination to make new voyages. I therefore bought goods, departed with them for the best seaport, and there, that I might not be obliged to depend upon a captain, but have a ship at my own command, I remained till one was built on purpose, at my own charge. When the ship was ready I went on board with my goods, but not having enough to load her, I agreed to take with me several merchants of different nations, with their merchandise. We sailed with the first fair wind, and after a long navigation the first place we touched at was a desert island, where we found the egg of a rock, equal in size to that I formerly mentioned. There was a young rock in it, just ready to be hatched, and its beak had begun to break the egg. The merchants who landed with me broke the egg with hatchets, and making a hole in it, pulled out the young rock piecemeal, and roasted it. I had in vain entreated them not to meddle with the egg. Scarcely had they finished their repast, when there appeared in the air, at a considerable distance, two great clouds. 59. The captain of my ship, knowing by experience what they meant, said they were the male and female parents of the rock, and pressed us to re-embark with all speed, to prevent the misfortune which he saw would otherwise befall us. Footnote 59. Mr. Marsden, in his notes to his translation of Marco Polo's underscore voyages underscore, supposes the rock to be a description of the albatross or condor, under greatly exaggerated terms. 
The two rocks approached with a frightful noise, which they redoubled when they saw the egg broken and their young one gone. They flew back in the direction they had come, and disappeared for some time, while we made all the sail we could in the endeavor to prevent that which unhappily befell us. They soon returned, and we observed that each of them carried between its talons an enormous rock. When they came directly over my ship, they hovered, and one of them let go his rock, but by the dexterity of the steersman it missed us and fell into the sea. The other so exactly hit the middle of the ship as to split it into pieces. The mariner sand passengers were all crushed to death or fell into the sea. I myself was of the number of the latter, but, as I came up again, I fortunately caught hold of a piece of the wreck, and swimming, sometimes with one hand and sometimes with the other, but always holding fast the plank, the wind and the tide favoring me, I came Tone Island and got safely ashore. I sat down upon the grass, to recover myself from my fatigue, after which I went into the island to explore it. It seemed to be a delicious garden. I found trees everywhere, some of them bearing green and others ripe fruits, and streams of fresh pure water. I ate of the fruits, which I found excellent, and drank of the water, which was very light and good. When I was a little advanced into the island, I saw an old man, who appeared very weak and infirm. He was sitting on the bank of a stream, and at first I took him to be one who had been shipwrecked like myself. I went toward him and saluted him, but he only slightly bowed his head. I asked him why he sat so still, but instead of answering me, he made a sign for me to take him upon my back, and carry him over the brook. I believed him really to stand in need of my assistance, took him upon me back, and having carried him over, bade him get down, and for the ten stooped, that he might get off with ease, but instead of doing so which I laugh at every time I think of it the old man, who to me appeared quite decrepit, threw his legs nimbly about my neck. He sat astride upon my shoulders, and held my throat so tight that I thought I would have strangled me, and I fainted away. Notwithstanding my fainting, the ill-natured old fellow still kept his seat upon my neck. When I had recovered my breath, he thrust one of his feet against my side, and struck me so rudely with the other thath forced me to rise up, against my will. Having arisen, he made me carry him under the trees, and forced me now and then to stop, that he might gather and eat fruit. He never left his seat all day, and when he lay down to rest at night he laid himself down with me, still holding fast about my neck. Every morning he pinched me to make me awake, and afterward obliged me to get up and walk, and spurred me with his feet. One day I found several dry calabashes that had fallen from a tree. I took a large one, and after cleaning it, pressed into it some juice of grapes, which abounded in the island. Having filled the calabash, I put it by in a convenient place, and going thither again some days after, I tasted it, and found the wine so good that it gave me new vigor, and so exhilarated my spirits that I began to sing and dance as he carried my burden. The old man, perceiving the effect which this had upon me, and that I carried him with more ease than before, made me a sign to give him some of it. I handed him the calabash, and the liquor pleasing his palet, he drank it off. There being a considerable quantity of it, he soon began to sing, and to move about from side to side in his seat upon my shoulders, and by degrees to loosen his legs from about me. Finding that he did not press me as before, I threw him upon the ground, where he lay without motion. I then took up a great stone and slew him. I was extremely glad to be thus freed forever from this troublesome fellow. I now walked toward the beach, where I met the crew of a ship that had cast anchor, to take in water. They were surprised to see me, but more so at hearing the particulars of my adventures. You fell, said they, into the hands of the old man of the sea, Andare the first who ever escaped strangling by his malicious embraces. He never quitted those he had once made himself master of, till he had destroyed them, and he has made this island notorious by the number of men he has slain. They carried me with them to the captain, who received me with great kindness. He put out again to sea, and after some days sail we arrived at the harbor of a great city, the houses of which overhung the sea. One of the merchants, who had taken me into his friendship, invited Mado go along with him. He gave me a large sack, and having recommended me to some people of the town, who used to gather coconuts, desired them to take me with them. Go, said he, follow them, and act as you see them do, but do not separate from them, otherwise you may endanger your life. Having thus spoken, he gave me provisions for the journey, and I went with them. We came to a thick forest of cocoa palms, sixty very lofty, with trunks so smooth that it was not possible to climb to the branches that bore fruit. When we entered the forest we saw a great number of apes of several sizes, 
who fled as soon as they perceived us, and climbed to the tops of the trees with amazing swiftness. Footnote 60. Cocoa palms bear their fruit at the top. The merchants with whom I was gathered stones, and threw them at the apes on the trees. I did the same, and the apes, out of revenge, threw coconuts at us so fast, and with such gestures, as sufficiently testified their anger and resentment. We gathered up the coconuts, and from time to time threw stones to provoke the apes, so that by this stratagem we filled our bags with coconuts. I thus gradually collected as many coconuts as produced me a considerable sum. Having laden our vessel with coconuts, we set sail, and passed by the islands where pepper grows in great plenty. From thence we went to the Isle of Kamari, where the best species of wood of aloes grows. I exchanged my coconuts in those two islands for pepper and wood ophalos, and went with other merchants pearl fishing. 61. I hired divers, who brought me up some that were very large and pure. I embarked in a vessel that happily arrived at Busora, from thence I returned to Baghdad, where I realized vast sums from my pepper, wood ophalos, and pearls. I gave the tenth of my gains in alms, as I had done upon my return from my other voyages, and rested from my fatigues. Footnote 61. Marco Polo, a famous voyager, 1298, gives an account of this pearl fishery. Sinbad here ordered 100 sequins to be given to Hindbad, Andre quested him and the other guests to dine with him the next day, to hear the account of his sixth voyage. The sixth voyage of Sinbad the Saillor I know, my friends, that you will wish to hear how, after having been shipwrecked five times, and escaped so many dangers, I could resolve again to tempt fortune, and expose myself to new hardships. I am myself astonished at my conduct when I reflect upon it, and must certainly have been actuated by my destiny, from which none can escape. Be that as it may, after a year's rest I prepared for a sixth voyage, notwithstanding the entreaties of my kindred and friends, who did all in their power to dissuade me. Instead of taking my way by the Persian Gulf I traveled once more through several provinces of Persia and the Indies, and arrived at a seaport. Here I embarked in a ship, the captain of which was bound on a long voyage, in which he and the pilot lost their course. Suddenly Wei saw the captain quit his rudder, uttering loud lamentations. He threw off his turban, pulled his beard, and beat his head like a madman. We asked him the reason, and he answered that we were in the most dangerous place in all the ocean. A rapid current carries the ship along with it, and we shall all perish in less than a quarter of an hour. Pray to God to deliver us from this peril. We cannot escape, if he do not take pity on us. At these words he ordered the sails to be lowered, but all the ropes broke, and the ship was carried by the current to the foot of an inaccessible mountain, where she struck and went to pieces, yet in sick a manner that we saved our lives, our provisions, and the best of four goods. The mountain at the foot of which we were was covered with wrecks, with a vast number of human bones, and with an incredible quantity of goods and riches of all kinds, these objects served only to augment our despair. In all other places it is usual for rivers to run from their channels into the sea, but here a river of fresh water, 62, runs from the sea into a dark cavern, whose entrance is very high and spacious. What is most remarkable in this place is that the stones of the mountain are of crystal, rubies, or other precious stones. Here I saw so a sort of fountain of pitcher bitumen, 63, that runs into the sea, which the fish swallow, and evacuate soon afterward, turned into ambergris, 64, and this the waves throw up on the beach in great quantities. Trees also grow here, most of which are of wood ophalos, 65, equal in goodness to those of Kamari. Footnote 62. Mr. Ives mentions wells of fresh water under the sea in the Persian Gulf, near the island of Barian, Hull. Footnote 63. Such fountains are not unfrequent in India and in Ceylon, and the Mohammedan travelers speak of ambergris swallowed by whales, who were made sick and regorge it. Whole. Footnote 64. Ambergris, a substance of animal origin, found principally in warm climates floating on the sea, or thrown on the coast. The best comes from Madagascar, Surinam, and Java. When it is heated or rubbed, it exhales an agreeable odor. Knights underscore English Cyclopedia underscore, volume. I, P, 142, footnote 65, camphor is the produce of certain trees in Borneo, Sumatra, and Japan. The camphor lies in perpendicular veins near the center of the tree, or in its knots, and the same tree exudes a fluid termed oil of camphor. The Venetians, and subsequently the Dutch, monopolize the sale of camphor. Underscore Encyclopedia Metropolitana Underscore, Volume 3, P. 195. 
Gibbons, in his notes to the underscore decline and fall underscore, says, from the remote islands of the Indian Ocean a large provision of camphor had been imported, which is employed, with a mixture of wax, to illuminate the palaces of the east. To finish the description of this place, it is not possible for ships to get off when once they approach within a certain distance. If they be driven thither by a wind from the sea, the wind and the current pull them, and if they come into it when a land wind blows, which might seem to favor their getting out again, the height of the mountain stops the wind, and occasions a calm, so that the force of the current carries them ashore, and what completes the misfortune is, that there is no possibility of ascending the mountain, or of escaping by sea. We continued upon the shore, at the foot of the mountain, in a state of despair, and expected death every day. On our first landing we HAD divided our provisions as equally as we could, and thus every one lived a longer or a shorter time, according to his temperance and THE use he made of his provisions. Illustration. Underscore having balanced my cargo exactly, and fastened it well to the raft, I went on board with two oars I had made page 281 underscore I survived all my companions, and when I buried the last I had so little provisions remaining that I thought I could not long survive, and I dug a grave, resolving to lie down in it because there was no one left to pay me the last offices of respect. But it pleased Godens more to take compassion on me, and put it in my mind to go to the bank of the river which ran into the great cavern. Considering its probable course with great attention, I said to myself, this river, which runs thus underground, must somewhere have an issue. If I make a raft, and leave myself to the current, it will convey me to some inhabited country, or I shall perish. If I be drowned, I lose nothing, but only change one kind of death for another. I immediately went to work upon large pieces of timber and cables, for he had a choice of them from the wrecks, and tied them together so strongly that I soon made a very solid raft. When I had finished, he loaded it with some chests of rubies, emeralds, ambergris, rock crystal, and bales of rich stuffs. Having balanced my cargo exactly, and fastened it well to the raft, I went on board with two oars that I had made, and leaving it to the course of the river, resigned myself to the will of God. As soon as I entered the cavern I lost all light, and the stream carried me I knew not whither. Thus I floated on in perfect darkness, and once found the arch so low, that it very nearly touched my head, which made me cautious afterward to avoid the like danger. All this while I ate nothing but what was just necessary to support nature, yet, notwithstanding my frugality, all my provisions were spent. Then I became insensible, I cannot tell how long I continued so, but when I revived, I was surprised to find myself on an extensive plain on the brink of a river, where my raft was tied, amidst a great number of negroes. I got up as soon as I saw them, and saluted them. They spoke to me, but I did not understand their language. I was so transported with joy that I knew not whether I was asleep or awake, but being persuaded that I was not asleep, I recited the following words in Arabic aloud, Call upon the Almighty, He will help thee, thou needest not perplex thyself about anything else, shut thy eyes, and while thou art asleep, God will change thy bad fortune into good. One of the Negroes, who understood Arabic, hearing me speak thus, came toward me, and said, Brother, be not surprised to see us, we are inhabitants of this country, and water our fields from this river, which comes out of the neighboring mountain. We saw your raft, and one of us swam into the river, and brought it hither, where we fastened it, as you see, until you should awake. Pray tell us your history. Whence did you come? I begged of them first to give me something to eat, and then I would satisfy their curiosity. They gave me several sorts of food, and when I had satisfied my hunger I related all that had befallen me, which they listened to with attentive surprise. As soon as I had finished, they told me, by the person who spoke Arabic and interpreted to them what I said, that I must go along with them, and tell my story to their king myself, it being too extraordinary to be related by any other than the person to whom the events had happened. They immediately sent for a horse, and having helped me to mount, some of them walked before to show the way, while the rest took my raft and cargo and followed. We marched till we came to the capital of Serendub, for it was on that island I had landed. The Negroes presented me to their king, I approached his throne, and saluted him as I used to do the kings of the Indies, that is to say, I prostrated myself at his feet. The prince ordered me to rise, received me with an obliging air, and made me sit down near him. I concealed nothing from the king, but related to him all that I have told you. At last my raft was brought in, and the bales opened in his presence. He admired the quantity of wood of aloes and ambergris, but, above all, the rubies and emeralds, for he had none in his treasury that equaled them. 
Observing that he looked on my jewels with pleasure, and viewed the most remarkable among them, one after another, I fell prostrate at his feet, and took the liberty to say to him, Sire, not only my person I sat your majesty's service, but the cargo of the raft, and I would begoff you to dispose of it as your own. He answered me with a smile, Sinbad, I will take nothing of yours, far from lessening your wealth, I design to augment it, and will not let you quit my dominions without marks of my liberality. He then charged one of his officers to take care of me, and ordered people to serve me at his own expense. The officer was very faithful in the execution of his commission, and caused all the goods to be carried to the lodgings provided for me. I went every day at a set hour to make my court to the king, and spent the rest of my time in viewing the city, and what was most worthy of notice. The capital of Serendib stands at the end of a fine valley, in the middle of the island, encompassed by high mountains. They are seen three days sail off at sea. Rubies and several sorts of minerals abound. All kinds of rare plants and trees grow there, especially cedars and coconut. There is also a pearl fishery in the mouth of its principal river, and in some of its valleys are found diamonds. A maid, by way of devotion, a pilgrimage to the place where Adam was confined after his banishment from paradise, and had the curiosity to go to the top of the mountain. When I returned to the city I prayed the king to allow me to return to my own country, and he granted me permission in the most obliging and honorable manner. He would force a rich present upon me, and at the same time he charged me with a letter for the commander of the faithful, our sovereign, saying to me, I pray you give this present from me, and this letter, to the Caliph Harun al-Rashid, and assure him of my friendship. The letter from the king of Serendib was written on the skin of a certain animal of great value, very scarce, and of a yellowish color. The characters of this letter were of azure, and the contents as follows. The king of the Indies, before whom march 100 elephants, who lives in a palace that shines with 100,000 rubies, and who has in his treasury 20,000 crowns enriched with diamonds, to Caliph Harun al-Rashid. Though the present we send you be inconsiderable, receive eight, however, as a brother and a friend, in consideration of the hearty friendship which we bear for you, and of which we're willing to give you proof. We desire the same part in your friendship, considering that we believe it to be our merit, as we are both kings. We send you this letter as from own brother to another. Farewell. The present consisted, one, of one single ruby made into a cup, about half a foot high, an inch thick, and filled with round pearls of half a dram each. Two, the skin of a serpent, whose scales were as bright as on ordinary piece of gold, and had the virtue to preserve from sickness those who lay upon it. 66, 3, 50,000 drams of the best wood of aloes, with 30 grains of camphor as big as pistachios and four, a female slave of great beauty, whose robe was covered with jewels. Footnote 66. There is a snake in Bengal whose skin is esteemed a cure for external pains by applying it to the part affected. Whole. The ship set sail, and after a very successful navigation we landed at Bussora, and from thence I went to the city of Baghdad, where the first thing I did was to acquit myself of my commission. I took the king of Serendib's letter, and went to present myself at the gate of the commander of the faithful, and was immediately conducted to the throne of the caliph. I made my obeisance, and presented the letter and gift. When he had read what the king of Serendib wrote to him, he asked me if that prince were really so rich and potent as he represented himself in his letter. I prostrated myself a second time, and rising again, said, Commander of the faithful, I can assure your majesty he did not exceed the truth. I bear him witness, nothing is more worthy of admiration than the magnificence of his palace. When the prince appears in public, 67, he has a throne fixed on the back of an elephant, and rides betwixt two ranks of his ministers, favorites, and other people of his court. Before him, upon the same elephant, an officer carries a golden lance, 68, in his hand, and behind him there is another, who stands with a rod of gold, on the top of which is an emerald, half a foot long and an inch thick. He is attended by a guard of 1,000 men, clad in cloth of gold and silk, and mounted on elephants richly caparisoned. The officer who is before him on the same elephant, cries from time to time, with a loud voice, Behold the great monarch, the potent and redoubtable Sultan of the Indies, the monarch greater than Solomon, and the powerful Maharaja. After he has pronounced those words, the officer behind the throne cries, in his turn, This monarch, so great and so powerful, must die, must die, must die. 69 and the officer before replies praise alone be to him who liveth forever and ever footnote 67 
The king is honorably distinguished by various kinds of ornaments, such as a collar set with jewels, sapphires, emeralds, and rubies of immense value. Marco Polo, p. 384, footnote 68. Throwing the lance was a favorite pastime among the young Arabians, and prepared them for the chase or war. Notes to underscore Vatic underscore, p. 295, footnote 69. Thus the Roman slave, on the triumph of an imperator, respice post te, hominem te esse memento, or the page of Philip of Macedonia, who was made to address him every morning, remember, Philip, thou art mortal. The caliph was much pleased with my account, and sent me home with a rich present. Here Sinbad commanded another hundred sequins to be paid to Hindbad, and begged his return on the morrow to hear his seventh and last voyage. The seventh and last voyage of Sinbad the sailor on my return home from my sixth voyage I had entirely given up all thoughts of again going to sea, for, besides that my age now required rest, I was resolved no more to expose myself to such risks as I had encountered, so that I thought of nothing but to pass the rest of my days in tranquility. One day, however, an officer of the caliphs inquired for me. The caliph, said he, has sent me to tell you that he must speak with you. I followed the officer to the palace, where, being presented to the caliph, I saluted him by prostrating myself at his feet. Sinbad, said he to me, I stand in need of your service, you must carry my answer and present to the king of Sarandab. This command of the caliph was to me like a clap of thunder. Commander of the faithful, I replied, I am ready to do whatever your majesty shall think fit to command, but I beseech you most humble I do consider what I have undergone. I have also made a vow never to leave Baghdad. Perceiving that the caliph insisted upon my compliance, I submitted, and told him that I was willing to obey. He was very well pleased, and ordered me one thousand sequins for the expenses of my journey. I prepared for my departure in a few days. As soon as the caliph's letter and present were delivered to me, I went to Bussorah, where I embarked, and had a very prosperous voyage. Having arrived at the Isle of Serendab, I was conducted to the palace with much pomp, when I prostrated myself on the ground before the king. Sinbad, said the king, you are welcome. I have many times thought of you, I bless the day on which I see you once more. I made my compliments to him, and thanked him for his kindness, and delivered the gifts from my august master. The caliph's letter was as follows, greeting, in the name of the sovereign guide of the right way, from the servant of God, Harun al-Rashid, whom God hath set in the place of vice-regent to his prophet, after his ancestors of happy memory, to the potent and esteemed Raja of Sarandab. We received your letter with joy, and send you this for more imperial residence, the garden of superior wits. We hope, when you look upon it, you will perceive our good intention, and be pleased with it. Farewell. The caliph's present was a complete suit of cloth of gold, valued a tone thousand sequins, fifty robes of rich stuff, a hundred of white cloth, the finest of Cairo, Suez, and Alexandria, a vessel of agate, more broad than deep, an inch thick, and half a foot wide, the bottom of which represented in bas-relief a man with one knee on the ground, who held a bow and an arrow, ready to discharge at a lion. He sent him also a rich tablet, which, according to tradition, belonged to the great Solomon. The king of Sarandab was highly gratified at the caliph's acknowledgement of his friendship. A little time after this audience I solicited leave to depart, and with much difficulty obtained it. Thekking, when he dismissed me, made me a very considerable present. I embarked immediately to return to Baghdad, but had not the good fortunato arrived there so speedily as I had hoped. God ordered it otherwise. Three or four days after my departure we were attacked by pirates, who easily seized upon our ship because it was not a vessel of war. Some of the crew offered resistance, which cost them their lives. But for myself and the rest, who were not so imprudent, the pirates saved us, and carried us into a remote island, where they sold us. I fell into the hands of a rich merchant, who, as soon as he bowed me, took me to his house, treated me well, and clad me handsomely as a slave. Some days after, he asked me if I understood any trade. I answered that I was no mechanic, but a merchant, and that the pirates who sold me had robbed me of all I possessed. Tell me, replied he, can you shoot with a bow? I answered, that the bow was one of my exercises, seventy, in my youth. He gave me a bow and arrows, and taking me behind him on an elephant, carried me to a thick forest some leagues from the town. We penetrated a great way into the wood, and when he thought fit to stop, he bade me light, then showing me a great tree, climb up that, 
said he, and shoot at the elephants as you see them pass by, for there is a prodigious number of them in this forest, and if any of them fall come and give me notice. Having spoken thus, he left me victuals and returned to the town, and I continued upon the tree all night. Footnote 70. The use of a bow was a constituent part of an Eastern education. Notes to underscore Vathic underscore P. 301. See the account of Cyrus's education, Xenophon's underscore Cyclopedia. Underscore, I saw no elephant during the night, but next morning, at break of day, I perceived a great number. I shot several arrows among them, and at last one of the elephants fell, when the rest retired immediately, and left me at liberty to go and acquaint my patron with my success. When I had informed him, he commended my dexterity, and caressed me highly. We went afterward together to the forest, where we dug a hole for the elephant, my patron designing to return when it was rotten, and take his teeth to trade with. I continued this employment for two months. One morning, as I looked for the elephants, I perceived with extreme amazement that, instead of passing by me across the forest as usual, they stopped, and came to me with a horrible noise, and in such numbers that the plain was covered and shook under them. They surrounded the tree in which I was concealed, with their trunks uplifted, and all fixed their eyes upon me. At this alarming spectacle I continued immovable, and was so much terrified that my bow and arrows fell out of my hand. My fears were not without cause, for after the elephants had starred upon me some time, one of the largest of them put his trunk round the foot of the tree, plucked it up, and threw it on the ground. I fell with the tree, and the elephant, taking me up with his trunk, laid me in his back, where I sat more like one dead than alive, with my quiver on my shoulder. He put himself at the head of the rest, who followed him in line one after the other, carried me a considerable way, then laid me down on the ground, and retired with all his companions. After having lain some time, and seeing the elephants gone, I got up, and found I was upon a long and broad hill, almost covered with the bones and teeth of elephants. I doubted not but that this was the burial place of the elephants, and that they carried me thither on purpose to tell me that I should forbear to kill them, as now I knew where to get their teeth without inflicting injury on them. I did not stay on the hill, but turned toward the city, and after having traveled a day and a night, I came to my patron. As soon as my patron saw me, ah, poor Sinbad, exclaimed he, I waste in great trouble to know what was become of you. I have been to the forest, where I found a tree newly pulled up, and your bow and arrows on the ground, and I despaired of ever seeing you more. Pray tell me what befell you. I satisfied his curiosity, and we both of us set out next morning to the hill. We loaded the elephant which had carried us with as many teeth as he could bear, and when we were returned, my master thus addressed me, Hear now what I shall tell you. The elephants of our forest have every year killed us a great many slaves, whom we sent to seek ivory. For all the cautions we could give them, these crafty animals destroyed them one time or other. God has delivered you from their fury, and has bestowed that favor upon you only. It is a sign that he loves you, and has some use for your service in the world. You have procured me incredible wealth, and now our whole city is enriched by your means, without any more exposing the lives of our slaves. After such a discovery, I can treat you no more as a slave, but as a brother. God bless you with all happiness and prosperity. I henceforth give you your liberty, I will also give you riches. To this I replied, Master, God preserve you. I desire no other reward for the service I had the good fortune to do to you in your city, but leave to return to my own country. Very well, said he, the monsoon, 71, will in a little time bring ships for ivory. I will then send you home. Footnote 71. Periodical winds blowing six months from the Semek quarter or point of the compass, then changing, and blowing the same time from the opposite quarter. I stayed with him while waiting for the monsoon, and during that time we made so many journeys to the hill that we filled all our warehouses with ivory. The other merchants who traded in it did the same, for my master made them partakers of his good fortune. The ships arrived at last, and my master himself having made choice of the ship wherein I was to embark, loaded half of it with ivory on my account, laid in provisions in abundance for my passage, and besides obliged me to accept a present of some curiosities of the country of great value. After I had returned him a thousand thanks for all his favors, I went aboard, we stopped at some islands to take in fresh provisions. Our vessel being come to a port on the mainland in the Indies, we touched there, and not being willing to venture by sea to Bussorah, I landed my portion of the ivory, resolving to proceed on my journey by land. I realized vast sums by my ivory, 
bought several rarities, which I intended for presents, and when my equipage was ready, set out in company with a large caravan of merchants. I was a long time on the journey, and suffered much, but was happy in thinking that I had nothing to fear from the seas, from pirates, from serpents, or from the other perils to which I had been exposed. I at last arrived safe at Baghdad, and immediately waited upon the caliph, to give him an account of my embassy. He loaded me with honor sand rich presents, and I have ever since devoted myself to my family, kindred, and friends. Sinbad here finished the relation of his seventh and last voyage, and then addressing himself to Hindbad, Well, friend, said he, did you ever hear of any person that suffered so much as I have done? Is it not reasonable that, after all this, I should enjoy a quiet and pleasant life? As he said these words, Hindbad kissed his hand, and said, Sir, my afflictions are not to be compared with yours. You not only deserve a quiet life but are worthy of all the riches you possess, since you make so good a use of them. May you live happily for a long time. Sinbad ordered him to be paid another hundred sequins, and told him to give up carrying burdens as a porter, and to eat henceforth at Histable, for he wished that he should all his life have reason to remember that he henceforth had a friend in Sinbad the sailor.